thank you for joining me today um, on this talk. Um, the talk's titled, We Make the Groups. And I welcome any feedback and any examples or objections that you might have. So today's plan is that I'll go through what I call objective accounts of social groups. Um, I'll give some examples of what they are. And I will argue that they, we run into problems trying to apply such accounts to certain types of social groups. My proposal to resolve this problem or an attempt to resolve this problem is that we take a subjectivist account of social group identity, after which I will go through certain considerations that come about. So objective accounts of social groups include accounts by Greenwood. Um, he describes, he distinguishes between aggregate groups and social groups. List and Pettit um, distinguish between mere collections, groups, and group agents. Ritchie, um, Catherine Ritchie, distinguishes between organized social groups and feature social groups. A problem that arises in these accounts is that for certain types of groups, we cannot begin to apply such accounts to examine a group because it's not clear where we should begin. So suppose we're interested in a group, um, call it group X. Um, I'm still thinking of an example <clears throat> whose membership and persistence conditions are not explicitly stated, um, such as in the case of an organized group, like a union, a government, um, a corporation. Um, in this case, how might we determine the membership and persistence conditions of that group. That is, what does it take to be a member of the group and what features matter in that group's identity and what it takes for that group to persist. I call this the starter problem. Where do we start? So one way we could try is to start with all known members of the group and examine whether they have some shared feature or previously unknown internal structure. But to do this requires that we know that all members of that group, uh, that we, know, we already know who all members of the group are. And in some cases, this is just what we are trying to discover. Um, the second way we might try to apply an objective account of group identity is to examine one individual or a small group of individuals whom we think are representative of that group. The problem with that is that um, how do we know the individual we've selected is representative of the group? We might select the wrong individual, um, in which case we would be completely wrong about the group's identity. Um, lastly, we might just assume that you know, all members of the group have a particular set of features and we just go on to apply an objective account and we say, um, you're a member of group X, members of group X have so-and-so features, and as long as a collection of persons who continue to possess those features continues to uh, persist, then the group persists. Um, so we still run into problems here, even though we can apply the count, because we make assumptions. Um, so the two separate problems that arise now are what I will call the problem of actual concerns and um, the problem of faultless disagreement. So according to the problem of actual concerns, um, it is possible that the shared feature or cluster of features may be completely different from what anyone cares about or considers relevant, and we may be wrong about the group's membership and persistence conditions. So if we make assumptions um, in examining a group, we might not account for what a group and its members actually care about with regard to the group's identity. That is, we might not address the actual concerns of a group or its members. So on objective accounts, um, the considerations of group members are irrelevant in considerations of group identity. The second problem that arises is the problem of faultless disagreement. In this case, two or more persons may agree on all the empirical facts about a group but still disagree about that group's synchronic and diachronic identity conditions, and no party to the disagreement may be incorrect. So here's an example um, from Cinderella. Cinderella and her stepsisters receive an invitation to, the, to a ball from the king, and on seeing the invite, Cinderella says, we are going to the ball. 
Drizella responds to Cinderella, we are going to the ball, but you are not. So I want to say that Cinderella and Drizella are both right in some sense. The subjectivist account allows for this. Um, the group that's picked out depends on the speaker. So by Cinderella's lights, she's correct in saying we're going to the ball. By Drizella's light, she's correct too in saying we are going to the ball, but you're not. In this case, the physical facts are the same. So Cinderella, Drizella, and Anastasia are females. Cinderella and Drizella are both 19 years old and Anastasia is 18 years old. So I'm assuming these are, you know, what would be acceptable age limits for a king in a fairy tale kingdom inviting girls to a ball for his son. The only difference here is between um, Cinderella's and Drizella's desires. So on the subjectivist account, um, a speaker may pick out a group at a time or a group over time. And I'll go on to say more about that later. Before I go into my account proper, I'd like to go into two-dimensionalism about social facts. So the first prominent account was by Searle and then by Thomason. The ones that I will spend a little time on today are Epstein's anchoring grounding model and um, Brower's forthcoming work on social inconsistency. So here we've got um, Epstein's 2015 anchoring grounding model. What I'm doing today is proposing a way that the anchoring facts might be. Brower and his work on social inconsistency proposes that there are two types of counterfactual reasoning about the social world. When we reason about the social world, the physical facts could have been different or the conditions that we require of the physical facts could have been different. And he goes on to say that this two-dimensional structure is what allows us to imagine a consistent physical world giving rise to an inconsistent social world. Moving on to the subjectivist account, um, here's what I call the slogan of the subjectivist account. A person's stage picks out a plurality when she uses a we token. So I borrow from the philosophy of language, um, I go into more detail on this in my paper. So a we token um, can be a speech utterance, a physical gesture, thought, belief, and any other means used by a person's stage with the intention of referring to a plurality of person stages that includes herself. So here I um, use perdurantist terms, but it can be translated into endurantist or extrantist terms as well. So um, utterances are straightforward, speech utterances, we are going to the ball. So gestures might be a sweep of the arm, um, thoughts, simply thinking about a group, and beliefs, those are just the beliefs we hold about the group. There is a sense in which um, even when we have a thought about a group, we form that group in our minds. A plurality is just any multiple of person stages who make up the group. And since I said that a person stage can make reference to a group at a time um, and a group over time, we've got synchronic pluralities and diachronic pluralities. So a synchronic plurality is just um, a plurality of person stages at a time. A diachronic plurality is just a plurality of person stages at more than just one time. Desired features are features that person stages possess and are relevant to our consideration of a particular group's identity. So two rules guide when a feature is a desired feature in the context of a particular group's identity. First, we have the context of use, which is just the context of person stages use of a we token. And second, we've got P's desires, that person stages desires regarding the group she intends to refer to, given the context of use. In the case of Cinderella, um, the utterance or the we token was a speech utterance, we are going to the ball. The context of use here is um, receiving a king's invite for all eligible maidens to attend the ball. Cinderella's desires, uh, the second thing that determine what the desired features are. So, um, she might think that eligible maidens are those who possess the features of being under the age of 25, 
being of noble birth, having never been married before, and so on. And it's her desires that determine the desired features. I'm putting this into um, Epstein's layout, we've got the anchoring facts here. So here you've got the context of use, Cinderella's desires, and these in turn they anchor the grounding conditions. So these are the grounding facts. These are physical facts. Cinderella, Drizella, and Anastasia, under the age of 25, of noble birth, and have never been married before. And these facts ground the social fact that Cinderella, Drizella, and Anastasia are eligible maidens. And so this is the group from Cinderella's perspective. Here is how Drizella differs and how, how we account for the differences. So the anchoring facts in this case, the context of use remains the same. Um, the desires that matter now are Drizella's desires. So these in turn anchor um, the following grounding conditions. So Drizella and Anastasia are under the age of 25, they are of noble birth, they have never been married before, and so on, and some other feature that Cinderella does not possess and excludes her. These are the grounding facts. Um, these in turn ground the social fact that Drizella and Anastasia are eligible maidens. So the group from Dr Drizella's perspective just includes Drizella and Anastasia. So before we move on to how I how a person stage can pick out a diachronic plurality. I just want to show you how um, this fits in the scheme of things. So this is the present time. Um, these are future times and these are past times, times in the past. So Drizella in her utterance of we are going to ball, but you are not, includes Anastasia, but excludes Cinderella. So this here is the synchronic plurality by Drizella's lights. Okay. So um, as I've said, a person can use we to refer to groups over time. So here we have Drizella making the utterance, we have never been servants and never will be. There are two ways to arrive at the diachronic plurality with this we utterance or we token um, and the group given the particular context of use. So we can rely just on um, the person stages desires, in this case, Drizella, or we can also rely on the desires of the synchronic plurality that was picked up by Drizella. And as I'll explain next. Here we've got um, possible person stages. This is grossly simplified, but I hope that it gets my example across. So Lady Tremaine, um, Drizella and Anastasia's mother was presumably once an eligible maiden too. Um, if you recall, this is the synchronic plurality that was picked out by Drizella. So here we have the diachronic plurality as picked out by Drizella, just Drizella's desires. As you can see, she includes all the X's, which are, this one should be included. All the X's, which are um, person stages, which she considers to have the desired features that she cares about, given her utterance. So, this is the diachronic plurality. Since this is person determined, only Drizella's desires matter in determining the diachronic plurality that goes on to make up the group. So the group is made up of all these person stages that have been um, circled. Let's see how things might be different. And this is how this agreement comes about. So um, let's see what Anastasia says. Anastasia might pick out the same synchronic plurality as Drizella. Anastasia here might include um, these person stages, the O's that Drizella excluded in her diachronic plurality. So the diachronic plurality by Anastasia's lights is more inclusive than Drizella's. So if you see here, the synchronic plurality when picked out by Drizella or Anastasia is the same. But because they care about different things, different diachronic pluralities are picked out. And both of them are right by their lights because it is their desires that matter and their desires that determine the desired features and therefore which person stages to include. The second way in which we might 
pick out a diachronic plurality is by appealing to the desires of the synchronic plurality. So Drizella here um, in her utterance, we have never been servants and we never will be, um, picks out a synchronic plurality. And that includes Anastasia. And she might care what Anastasia thinks and she might ask Anastasia, um, so who should we include? Who should we exclude um, in this case? And they might have come to, to an agreement that um, certain desired features are what matter, in which case all person stages at other times who possess those desired features um, are part of the diachronic plurality. So that's how the account works. It's very summarized because this um, is a pretty short presentation. Um, lastly, I just want to run through some brief um, thoughts I have about the account. So aggregate groups um, or mere collections can be meaningful groups on this account because they are meaningful to the person considering the group. Um, I like to think that such an account also explains intra-group disagreement. So we do disagree about the groups we belong to, and this may sometimes have consequences on our decision-making process. Um, lastly, when we consider race, gender, and other controversial topics, um, it's possible that um, taking a subjectivist approach might explain those differences, and perhaps it should be something we keep in mind when we um, discuss such controversial topics. So here we have the references, and thank you um, for your time. And again, I welcome any feedback.